Well, good evening, church family. It is so good to have you back here on Wednesday night for our Wednesday night Bible study. And, uh, you know, I, I forget sometimes. Matter of fact, I don't think I've ever done this. And, and I realize this week that we have many folks that uh, watch our Bible study that uh, are not a part of our GBC family. And uh, uh, they're, they're part of our overall, as we've said before, our umbrella of, of believers in Christ. And we're grateful. Uh, but uh, some of you may actually not know who I am. I never say my name or who I am, but my name is Larry Vaughn, and it is my joy and my privilege to serve Germantown Baptist Church as it is administrative pastor. And so uh, we welcome all of you tonight who are, who are watching our uh, Bible study, and whether you're part of GBC or another church, uh, and uh, if by chance, by chance you're watching this Bible study and you're not a part of a local church and you're here in the Germantown area, we would love to have you come visit us here at Germantown Baptist Church. Uh, we like uh, um, most folks would think that their, their church is the best church in the world and we think our, our church is to not because of people, we're all just simply sinners saved by grace, but because of what God is doing in the midst of our church here at Germantown Baptist. So uh, I wanted to say that tonight because uh, it's, uh, it's important for you to know that uh, you're loved uh, and maybe there's somebody out there that needs just a, an encouraging word tonight. Know that God loves you that uh, we here at Germantown Baptist Church love you. And if you don't have a church home, if you don't have the privilege to fellowship with other believers in Christ, we would love to have you join us here at Germantown Baptist Church. We don't want to take, a, take you away from your own church if you're active in a local church. But if you're not, we'd love to have you here. As we continue our study tonight in the book of Philippians, Philippians, the first chapter, we're going to be looking at verses 19 through 26 tonight. And we're going to, we're going to continue. Matter of fact, we're going to kind of, uh, uh, the continuation from last week when we looked at the joy of ministry. And so we're going to say today is the joy of Paul's ministry part two. And, and I want us to remember something as we begin our text tonight is that despite all the trials and troubles and suffering and sorrow that Paul experienced, his ministry was nevertheless a joyful experience for himself. So even in the midst, remember, even in the midst of all the struggles and trials and tribulations, that he still found it a joy to do ministry in Christ Jesus. Now tonight we're going to look at two things. We're going to, we're going to look at these, these verses here in chapter 1, beginning with the 19th verse. And there's two things that I think we are going to look at that I want us to see. And one is that Paul is going to tell us something. He's going to say that whether I'm dead in Christ or whether I'm alive in Christ, it makes no difference. Because either way, I'm going to glorify God in the things that I do. So Paul was dealing with two uh, opposing uh, sides to this, this struggle in life he had. He says, he's going to tell us, he's going to say that, that as much as I want to be here and doing ministry, if that's what God wants, I, I just as much want to go and be with him in heaven. I'm ready to leave this world but if God wants me to stay, I'm ready to stay and do what he would have me to do. So we're going to look tonight at two things. We're going to look at what Paul is talking about, death in Christ or life in Christ. Either one, either one Paul says I am okay with. So let's begin tonight with this idea of in spite of death, as long as the Lord is glorified. In spite of death, even in death, as long as it glorify God. So let's look at Philippians. Let's jump right into it tonight. The scripture, and by the way, we have a lot of scripture tonight, so I hope you got your Bibles with you and you're ready to go. You're going to be flipping pages tonight trying to stay up with us. But we're going to begin tonight in Philippians, the first chapter, verses 19 through 21. Now Paul says, for I know. Now I like that. He says, it's not a question in his mind. He says, I know. He says, I know that this will turn out for my 
deliverance. Paul is saying, and see here is, this is such a beautiful picture here, folks. Paul is saying, I know. There's no question in my mind. You know, from time to time, I have the privilege to talk to people about their salvation. And uh, I have people will say, I, well, I think I'm saved. Well, I, I think I've done enough good stuff. I, I think I'm going to heaven. Well, this relationship with Christ is not a matter of thinking. It's a matter of knowing. And it's important that you understand that you know that you know that you know. You know, especially with little children, I had the privilege to, to, to lead many, many children to Christ in, in my ministry. And one thing I want them to know is, is I'll, 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 usually I'm, I've got them in my office or in the church somewhere, and, and I'm, I'm trying to explain to them salvation and what their relationship with Christ looks like. And when I feel like that they understand, at least to the, for the most part, we never fully understand everything there is to know about God. We won't do that this side of heaven. But when I think for a young person especially, for them to, to know what that relationship with Christ looks like, I ask them to do something usually. I'll ask them to look around the room. And I'll ask them to pick something out, maybe a stained glass. My uh, office sometimes uh, that I've had in the past have had stained glass windows or have libraries or books all over and different things. And I'll, I'll say, pick out something in this room and you concentrate on that. And I said, I want you to remember that. I want you to remember this time and this place. You may forget the exact day. You may even forget what year it was sometimes. But I want you to pick out something in this room that you'll never forget that will help you nail down the fact of your relationship with Christ. And help you nail down that, that anchor that you can put in the ground, that stake that you can drive in the ground and say, I remember. I remember like it was yesterday. I remember that, that when I accepted Christ 60 years ago for me, that's a long time, isn't it? But I remember. I remember the church I was in. I remember the pew I was sitting in. I remember the pastor that I walked down and took by the hand. I remember every one of those things because it was so important to me. And I, I tell people, nail that down so that you know that you know because there'll come times in your life, uh, even when you have a personal relationship with Christ that Satan will get a hold of you, sin will separate you from God to a certain extent, and you'll sometimes doubt whether I'm saved. But anytime I doubt, and I have in my, my past, uh, I'm human, I live in the flesh, I have doubt my salvation, and I can go back and I can nail it down, and I, it puts a smile on my face and, 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 and satisfaction in my heart to be able to say, I know that I know because I remember that time. I remember that place. I remember those circumstances around me. And that's important. So Paul says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my eager expectation and hope. Paul wasn't just living out a joyful ministry. He lived out his life with an expectation of, of uh, glorifying God in how he lived and, and a hope. You see, we live in a world, folks, I don't have to explain anything to you. You just have to look around. Our world is losing hope. We, we've turned our backs on God. We've turned our backs on the scriptures. We've turned our backs on the church. We've turned our backs on our relationship with Christ. And this world is in a mess. And outside this world, turning back to Jesus, we ain't got a chance. But you and I as believers in Christ, we have hope. Remember, 
what I've said over and over again since we've looked at this uh, scripture in Philippians, that Paul's joy was not dictated by the circumstances that were around him. Paul's joy was dictated by the Holy Spirit that lives within him. According to my eager expectations and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body. Now get this, whether by life or by death, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Amen. I hope I have a collective amen out there. If you're sitting sitting at home on your couch or there at your table in the, in the, in the kitchen, wherever you're at, man, that should be an amen for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Well, as we look at this, this last analysis of, of Paul, Paul, Paul was imprisoned, he was maligned, he was facing possible execution. As long as, as, as he was preaching the gospel, he was, in, he was in trouble, but he was going to preach the gospel no matter what because he was fully confident that despite all his negative circumstances, the Lord's cause would be triumph. In spite of all the situation he was in, that the Lord would be glorified. So as we think about this, in spite of death, as long as the Lord was glorified, I want us to look at some things that was, Paul was confident in. Confident in. Number one, he had confidence in the precept of the Lord. He Look at what it says in Philippians 1.19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and provisions of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He says, I know without a shadow of a doubt that everything's going to be okay. I want to tell you something, folks. Man, you're just like I am. I've had some struggles. I've had some trials. I've laid in those hospital beds. I've had those cancer diagnoses. I've had, I've had everything I guess you've had. You've had the same things. I've had those disappointments in life. I've had, but, but I know. See, I have a hope in Christ Jesus that makes me know that everything is going to be okay. God's Word tells me it is going to be okay. Look at what it says in Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. You know what that means, folks? That means that no matter what's taking place in my life, no matter what's going on in my life, no matter what, that God is in control and that he's going to work out all things. It didn't say one or two things. It didn't say a couple of things that happened yesterday and a couple of things that happened today. It says causes all things, everything in a believer's life. Get this, all things to work together for what? My good. God only wants the best for his children. God only wants to give us the good things in life. So he, he's always going to give us the good thing, especially deliverance, especially salvation. Paul, Paul knew that his present circumstances, and we forget, Paul knew that his present circumstances were temporary. We forget many times that our present circumstances, no matter what they are, are temporary. Paul had confidence in the Lord. Confidence in whether it was life or death, he would be delivered. God was going to deliver him one way or the other. So Paul had, conf Paul had confidence in the prayers of the saints. Paul believed in the limitless sovereignty of God. You know what the unlimited sovereignty of God means? The limitless sovereignty of God, it means that God's in control. It means that God is everywhere. He's, he's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He knows all. He sees all. He's sovereign over us. And he knew with perfect confidence because of God's word that, that his life would be full. 
and that his purpose would be fulfilled. And his purpose is the same purpose you and I have, is to glorify God. He knew that God's sovereign plan incorporated the prayers of people. God intended prayers to be part of his perfect plan for you and me. God had confidence Paul had confidence in the prayers of the saints. James 5, 16. <clears throat> Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. I want to tell you something, folks. You have, you have bitterness in your heart towards someone else. You struggle with someone in your life that's giving you a hard time. There's difficulties between and strife between you and another person whether it be a friend or family member or some, someone else, I challenge you something. Pray for that person. You'll find that your attitude towards that person will change when you pray. Pray for that person. The scripture goes on to say in James that a prayer of a righteous person, when it is brought about, can accomplish much. In other words, the, the righteous prayer, the prayers of a righteous man accomplish much. So when you pray and you pray for someone else, it accomplishes great things. Paul, before Paul visited the church at Rome, he had implored the believers in Romans 15:30. He says, Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, I urge you, fellow believers, I urge you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. He says, he says if there's one thing that I covet, it's your prayers. You know, as, as a pastor, if there's, if there's one thing that I covet, I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm a sinner just like you are. I live in the flesh every day. And the one thing I covet is I covet your prayers. The one thing you should covet is the prayers of others. The affected, effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman availeth much. Nothing is more encouraging to those in ministry than to know that they are being prayed for. To know that there's intercessory prayer going on for them. So Paul had confidence in the prayers of the saints. Thirdly, Paul had confidence in the provisions of the Spirit. The Word of God, the prayers of the saints, and the power of the Holy Spirit always work together for the benefit of the servant of God. <clears throat> Look what it says in John the 14th chapter, verses 16 and 17. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper so that he may be with you forever. The helper is the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. You see, when, when Christ ascended back to the Father, he says, I will leave that great comforter, the helper, the Holy Spirit with you. That Holy Spirit, that same Holy Spirit that indwells within you and me as believers. That same Holy Spirit that guides and directs us, that convicts us. That same Holy Spirit that helps us pray. That same Holy Spirit that helps us work. The same Holy Spirit that helps us do the will of God in our life. The, whole, the whole Holy Spirit is what makes believers sufficient in, in their resources to do the Lord's work. The Holy Spirit gives us everything that we need to do God's will. So those provisions that we need to be full and bountiful and sufficient are supplied by the Holy Spirit. So Paul had confidence in the provision of the Spirit. Fourthly, Paul had confidence in the promise of Christ. Look what it says in verse 20. It says, According to my eager expectations and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. Confidence in the promise of Christ. This, this idea, this, 
this earnest expectation and hope. It wasn't a false hope. It wasn't a fake expectation. It was grounded. It was grounded in the Lord's promises. God made promises to his disciples. God made promises to you and to me. God always fulfills those promises. Paul Paul expressed his supreme joy when he wrote, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body. May everything I do exalt Christ. Lastly, number five is confidence in the plan of God. Look at what he goes on to say. For to me to live is Christ and to die is God. Paul was not certain what God's plan was for him. Whether he would continue to serve and exalt him through his life and ministry or through the final exaltation of death. Paul wasn't fully aware. He wasn't certain of what God's plan was. You see, I, I don't know what tomorrow holds. But I know who holds tomorrow. And you see, I don't have to know what God's plan in, in full is for my life. All I have to do is live each day glorifying Him and let Him show me through the Holy Spirit what His plan is. We wake up in a new world every day. We wake up in a world where we have the privilege to serve a true and living God, where we have the privilege to glorify God in everything that we do. And when we wake up, it's a new day. It's a bright new day. It's a day for us to glorify Him. I don't know what God's plan is. I don't know what God's plan is for the next hour in my life. But I have sufficient faith in the sovereignty of God to know that He has a plan and a purpose for my life and that His plan will be fulfilled. Paul was not certain what the plan was, but Paul knew that God would take care of that plan. Acts 20, 24. But I do not consider my life any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of God's grace. Paul unequivocally declared the ultimate sovereignty of God in his life, whether it be in death or whether it be in life whether it be because of God's marvelous grace, ultimately Paul would find gain in everything that he did. So we see that in, in spite of, of the death, we also live life in the flesh. So second thing I want us, I told you we were going to talk about whether in death I glorify God or whether in life I glorify God. It makes no difference. That's what Paul was saying. So in spite of being in the flesh, as long as the church was benefited. <clears throat> Look at Paul said, beginning in verse 22. He says, but, I, but if I am to live on the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. So what he's saying is, if God allows me to live, if God allows me a few more days, a few more months, a few more years, then I want to be fruitful in my labors. And I do not know which to choose, but I am hard-pressed. Paul's saying, you know, I don't know which way to go. I don't know whether I want to stay here and labor for the Lord or I want to go on to be with heaven. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart. Man, Paul's heart's desire was to go and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet, to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all of your progress and joy in the faith so that your pride in Christ Jesus may be abundant because of me by my coming to you again. Part of the spiritual greatness is to know Christ in intimately, to know him personally and to to long to be with Him. And that's what Paul longed to be with Christ. S spiritual greatness is to depend totally upon Christ. Advancing the kingdom is to depend totally 
upon Christ. Serving the Lord while we're here on earth is to rely totally upon Christ in our life. But there's a tension. There's a tension there. You know, ever since the day you asked Jesus to come into your life, ever since the day you sealed your eternity in heaven, there is a little bit of tension in your life. And that tension is, do I want to remain here on this earth and serve the Lord, or do I want to benefit by eternal life with Christ Jesus in heaven? That, that question we find over and over. I, I hear people say from time to time who, who struggle. And maybe it's health issues, maybe it's other things, but who really struggle. And they said, and they just say something like, Lord Jesus, just, just take me home. Just take me home. Why would you hear someone say that? It's not that they, as the world would say it, they have a death wish, but as, as God's people would say it, they have a wish to go to be with Christ forever, to leave the, the heartache and the pain of this world and to go into eternity with Christ Jesus. Philippians, the third chapter, verses 7 through 9 says, But whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss because of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ. Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them mere rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ." the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. You see, there's nothing good about me. Paul, Paul said it over and over again. He said, there's nothing good in me. There's no righteousness in me except the imparted righteousness of Christ Jesus that I have in me because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Look at it says in Philippians 3, 12 and 13. Not that I have already grasped it, all or have already become perfect, but I press on. If I may also take hold of that which I was even taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, talking to the church at Philippi, talking to believers, brothers and sisters, I do not regard myself as having taken hold of it yet. But one thing I do know, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Remember, sometimes we spend so much time thinking about the past, we can't deal with the present, and we have no vision for the future. Paul says, but one thing I know, forgetting what lies behind me and reaching forward, pressing on, pressing forward to the high, the high mark, the high calling, pressing forward to what lies ahead. I remember Paul's caution to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 321, he says, So then no one is to be boasting in people, for all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All things belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Period. Stop. I could stop right there. I could end everything we're talking about right there. Look at, what he, look at what the scripture says. It says, And you, all things belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Thus it was Christ Jesus working in Paul, working in him, that would cause the Philippian believers to, to have confidence, not just confidence, but confidence that abound, that no circumstances, no situation would separate them in their ministry from fulfilling the cause of Christ. Nothing could keep them from, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, always abounding in the work of the Lord because he knew that his toil was not in vain in the Lord. Remember something tonight, folks. You can do a lot of things. You can work hard. You can, you can do things with your family, you can do things with 
your work, you can do things, you can do volunteerism, you can bless people over and over again. But remember, the only things that really matter is the work we do for the Lord. You know, I don't I want this to come off negative, but, you know, ask ourselves sometimes, how much time do we give to the Lord? How much time do we give to our jobs? How much time do we have to give to our families? How much time do we give to all kinds of things that we do? And then ask ourselves, how much time do we give to God when the things that we give to God are what really matter? I'm so glad you've been with us tonight. Thank you for being with us. I hope you'll come back next Wednesday night as we continue our study in the book of Philippians. Oh, it's great to study the life of Paul because we learn so much as we study the Word from what Paul demonstrated in his life. Demonstrate the fact that circumstances are not going to change my joy. May you have a joyful week no matter what circumstances you find yourself in. And may God put someone in your path that you can share Jesus with. God bless you. Have a great week.